We are live. Okay. Hello, everybody, to a very special episode of the Practical Magic Show. It's very special because of our guests. It's also very special because it is our second to last episode of season one, which is wild. And I'm so excited to be winding down the season with one of my favorite people ever, whom I will introduce in just a moment. But if you're new to the Practical Magic Show, the Practical Magic Show is what I call the Penn and Teller of business. Penn and Teller, if you don't know them, great, great magicians, and then they reveal how they did the trick. And this is what the Practical Magic Show is about, finding the people in the world who create epic and magical results, but they are not hustling and grinding and slumming it at the bottom. They're creating amazing results in magical ways, and so we are reverse engineering how they do it. And so along that vein, we absolutely should and must have Laban Ditchburn on our show, who is the world's number one courage coach, a dear friend, and one of my favorite all-time people. Laban, you uh, you entered my life very much like um, like a what is it called when a star explodes? A supernova. Like you just like <laughs> popped into my life with that much power and that much force, and like. I didn't know you. And then all of a sudden we were talking all the time. And, and, you know, I've started to call that with other people who know you, the, the ditch burn effect. You just are one of these people. You make things happen with effortless and ease and charisma and swagger. And you are one of the most inspiring people I know. So I'm really excited to have you here to talk about courage and what that creates. And I know you love the term massive action, but I had an aversion to that term until you started using it with me. Because you talk about courage and massive action in a way that's really different than most people that I know. And what I mean by that is the other half of what I see is your magic is that not only are you the number one courage coach in the world and a master at massive action, you also have a really intuitive gift in mapping that precisely to the person that you're working with. In other words, you know exactly how to make it work for them versus kind of forcing the way you do it onto them. So I'm really excited to talk about this and have you here. Well, not as excited as I am, Vanessa. And for those that have <laughs> dialed in that haven't subscribed and rated this podcast, get on now and subscribe. Rate this and watch these episodes because this is some life altering, DNA alteringly good content. <laughs> if you go through the, the first season, and I'm very excited for season two, and uh, super uh, grateful that you've invited me on the podcast to share this uh, wonderful message with the world. Yeah, thank you. So, um, where do I want to dive in? Gosh, you know what I'd love for you to do? Could you, because, you know, I think a lot of people talk about courage and massive action. And I don't know that they embody it the way you do. So would you mind telling a story or two of a time where you displayed this kind of courage or massive action and a result that it created? Because just because I want to have for people to have a little context of what we're talking about. Well, six years ago, I found myself sitting up in my bed on a Tuesday night with three and a half bottles of appropriately priced Pinot Noir coursing its way through my veins. And I was gambling on a horse race in a country that I wasn't in, spending money that was not mine. Mm. And I had this epiphanous moment where I was like, this is not the life that I imagined for myself. And as I finished that thought, I looked in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen and there was a phone number that I'd never seen. And I must have been on that website a dozen times. And it was the number for the gambler's helpline. And I called the number and I had this wondrous conversation with a woman by the name of Mary, whose last real name I'll never know, but I have ordained her my Mary Magdalene because she was my guardian angel, whether she knew it or not. And she spoke to me about the incredibly high rates of suicide that problem gamblers experience. And gambling was one of my vices, drinking and drugs and philandering and negative self-talk and a number, a litany of other dysfunctions. And she put me in touch with a gambling counsellor through the Salvation Army. And that started this, this six-year journey of transformation. And I'm very proud to stand before you to share that I've been sober from alcohol for over five years. Gambling's six years in December, longer for drugs. And, and 
the courage that I took initially, which doesn't seem like that big a deal now, was really a huge catalyst for change. And it triggered something wondrous in me. And when you go through a, a journey like that, it's too good to keep to yourself. Mm. And so for people that want to know and want ideas on how they might be able to do it, this is now my purpose, to be known as the most positively influential speaker on the planet. And in the process, the world's best courage coach, because that's a commitment to me and how I look at my life. And so every morning I wake up and I ask myself the same question, how would the world's best courage coach attack this day? Hmm. And that's where we are. You know, it's interesting because you said like looking back, it doesn't seem like that was that big a deal to call, but I can imagine that I actually think it's a, it's a really great example because the act of picking up a phone and dialing a number just in and of itself, like sure, maybe it doesn't look like a big deal, but if you sort of reverse engineer why that took so much courage, I think that could be really valuable. Well, for me, I just, it was, a, it was a number of rock bottoms and I just got sick of bouncing. Mm. And I was like, can I swear? Hell yeah. I was like, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> I like this sucks. And I was in my, I was 35 at the time and my life was heading in a direction that was, that was trending downward. And I was like, this is not how things are supposed to work out. Mm. And the pain that I was in was far worse than the thought of admitting that I had a problem. Mm. And then when I started opening up and realizing that, that why I'd gotten to that point was due to this dysfunctional childhood that I had, which for me was nothing more innocuous than being a child of divorce mm. and having parents whom I loved and had forgiven, but they were ill-equipped to esteem themselves, let alone their children. And, and when I came to understand how that came about and why that was impacting me in such a negative way, it was a really powerful moment for me. And I was like, the pain of that is nowhere near as terrifying as the, the pain of change. Hmm. And I just went towards it, you know. And so it was it was how painful your life had been and how sick of being there you were. Got jack of it. I knew I knew from a very, very young age. And I don't know if other people experience this. I I, I expect that people do, but sometimes we're just not in tune with it. That I was destined for much, much greater things. That mm -hmm. my reason for being on the planet was not to be working in recruitment, going and getting fucked up on the weekends and blowing on my money gambling and you know, hooking up with with people that weren't supposed to be in my life, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and uh, that that was a, a really enlightening moment for me. One I'm very grateful that I experienced. And it does take a ton of courage because to make a decision to change when you don't know what change looks like is a tremendous act of courage. Well, I would encourage anyone that's on the on the fence with regards to this stuff to just. Fuck it and go for it. Because what happens is when you are given permission to share in the right environment without judgment, and that's what Lee, the, the gambling psychologist, allowed me to do. It, it, it allowed me to share this burden of responsibility and it lightened the load on me. And I didn't realize how much weight I was carrying metaphorically and mm. spiritually. Physically, I was fat too, so I was carrying even more weight. <laughs> and... Uh, and then the more I spoke about it and then started speaking with other people about it, I realized the power of sharing my own demons mm -hmm. and how that allowed other people to feel not quite so bad about the shit that they'd gone through. And it's it's really important, the distinction <clears throat> that, you know, divorce, child abuse, adoption, being abandoned, like, you know, being horribly burned and disfigured or whatever whatever you went through like our interpretation of trauma is very individualistic and and uh it's not about comparing yourself to anyone else's shit i think that's really important that's really important because if your whatever your level of trauma you had was like that's the stuff you've got to work through and if you judge it as insignificant then you're never going to work through it yeah i mean it's really fascinating about you. 
um, and I and I see this more every time we talk. You have a real like sexy courage stories where you do things like call Brene Brown and call Les Brown and apparently you're looking for Browns, but <laughs> you know, and call the CEO of uh, a, like a major corporate company and get hired to speak. Like these are the sexy stories that you tell that we can definitely dive into because I think they're relevant and very important. But the thing that fascinates me about you is that what's under the, there's an undercurrent to your courage story and it's self-esteem. It's me, it seems like. You talk a lot about negative self-talk and the esteem with which you hold yourself. And every time I leave a conversation with you, I, that's where I'm challenged. Like, I gotta look at myself differently. Well, no, you, you've nailed the, the main catalyst for it all. Because if you review any of the videos, podcasts, interviews, whatever it might be, particularly in the last 12 months, if you can catch me talking about myself negatively, I'll pay you a hundred bucks and it's because I've removed all negative self-talk out of my vernacular. And, and when I did that, it created this awareness of how other people spoke. Mm. And I realized we all know the power of, of our words. Some people don't, but if you haven't put two and two together and realized that there is so much power with the, the language that we use, and it's not that I'm making light or fun of the, bad shit that I might do from time to time. I continue to make mistakes uh, and I am a deeply flawed individual. That's not negative self-talk. That's just an admittance of, of the, re the reality, right? Perfection is, is, is a, a falsehood. Mm. And, but I have a lot of fun with it now because I really love who I am. My self-esteem is really fucking good. <laughs> it's really good. It, and it was only when I loved who I am and who I was, that then I was allowed to be loved by others. And then incidentally, in the couple of months that I had that another epiphanous moment where I, was, I realized that I did, had fallen in love with the person that I am, that I met the woman of my dreams. Mm. You know, we've been together three, three and a bit years now, and she's the person that I knew that I wanted to meet, but was beginning to think that I never would meet her. And, mm. you know, we're like twin flames. We burn brighter together. Yeah. And uh, and that's that's I think what you're picking up on. There is a supreme self belief, uh, and especially understanding what my purpose on this planet is is also a real powerful catalyst. Yeah. So can you talk about that process of eliminating self negative self talk? I I, yeah, I mean you've caught me in it more times than I care to admit, and I thought I didn't do it as often as I realize that I do when I'm with you. So talk about that process what does that what did that look like for you in australia new zealand england to the us and canada to some extent and some other english speaking countries but mainly those those the aforementioned ones self deprecating humor is a part of the culture in many cases and i've had a couple of attempts at some amateur comedy and i've reviewed the footage from 5 and 6 years ago 6 and 7 years ago rather and I cringe at it yeah. because it's not actually humorous. It's not funny. And, and when I realized that if I was to succeed and, and to achieve the things I needed to achieve, I needed to really respect who I was. Otherwise, other people weren't going to respect me. Yeah. And I think that's the catalyst saying I'm no good at that or I'm, you know, or, or playing down whatever talent you have. It's not actually cool. And you need to stop it right now. And, and some wonderful advice I got from Jack Canfield, he spoke about getting a swear jar in your home, but rather than swearing, every time you say something negative about yourself, put five bucks in there, not $1 mm. or five euros or five pound, wherever you're listening to this, 500 million Zimbabwean dollars or whatever. <laughs> and, and catch yourself because when you, when you pay attention to how you speak, like I said earlier, you, you become dialed into how other people and you can, catch them out mm. and and most people you know that, that love and respect you won't mind that and they'll they'll see the benefits themselves i can see that being a really fun thing to do with like people that are the closest to you and that you know also can relate and see this that you venmo the other person five dollars 
<laughs> where it's like, oh, you're busted, Venmo. You know, it's like you're gonna get careful pretty quickly. <laughs> you got to put a value on it. You got to put a value on it, and and by becoming hyper aware of how other people talk around you, particularly people in your life, it helped me become aware of who I wanted and who I didn't want in my life, mm -hmm. and just by pure osmosis or whatever you want to call it, 97% of my former circle of friends that I used to kick around with, I no longer have anything to do with or very little. And it's not that they're bad people, far from it, but it's it's just a case of where I want to be and, and the way that they talk about themselves, the way they go about day to day just doesn't serve me well. And it's, you know, we become like the five people we spend the most time around. People heard this time and time again, but it's scientifically proven. Mm. And so I only allow high quality people in my life and that's why i love you vanessa you know you, you're a part of this amazing network of very very high quality people and you know you talk about me having an impact on your life well, I, I can't explain to you the gratitude that i've felt from the introductions the time we've spent together and the impact you've had on on my fiance and my life mm -hmm. it's it's simply it's a daily fucking miracle is what it is and so i'm i'm the lucky one. Oh man thank you taking that on so um, let me ask you a follow-up question to the negative self-talk because here's the roadblock that I've bumped into. So I can imagine that it's one that other people will bump into. When you are really in a space of negative self-talk, it feels like lying to yourself to try to talk about yourself positively. So how do you bridge that gap? That Because it, it's not about... I don't think you're talking about like toxic positivity where you're like, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Or even talking yourself out of something because the way you do it is very, has a lot of integrity, right? It's really real. So how do you bridge that gap when it doesn't feel true? I think in the context of this, to start off really simplistically, it's about, oh, I could never do this or I, I'm not good enough or I'm only an amateur or... Uh, I can't. Why not? What's stopping you? What is it? And then when you really start asking these these questions to yourself or to other people, if it, it forces them, particularly with an open question, to think about, oh, because I'm old. Well, what's stopping you from running a marathon? Oh, I've got sore hips. Well, what if you could fix your sore hip? And 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 when you start breaking down. The, the barrier of why they're saying no, all of a sudden you go, oh, well, yeah, I suppose I could probably do that. Mm -hmm. And 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 one begets two, two begets three. And then before you know it, like you look back over the last couple of years, and if I showed you a graph of the direction of my life, it's like Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, and uh, and I got an early. Yeah. And uh, and and that's the, the, the power of this. And, you know, like I mentioned, I still make mistakes. I make way less now that I'm not drinking and doing drugs. <laughs> way less. I can relate to that. <laughs> but if I do muck something up, I look at every incident in my life as a learning period, like a growth period for me. All of the all of the women that I was slept with, all of the dates I went on, all the money I lost, the career that I was in that didn't serve me well has all given me the ammunition and the fuel to be able to be in a position of credibility when I talk about overcoming adversity and having courage. You can't go around calling yourself the world's best courage coach if you don't exemplify how the world's best courage coach would fucking act. And, right. and so that's a really important distinction. So I can't go around telling people to not have negative self-talk if I'm saying, oh, no, oh, nah, I'm an idiot, whatever. It, yeah. like, even me saying that as an example gives me goosebumps it's horrible oh, <laughs> it's, well, i love that because you know what i hear is the difference between trying to like affirm that you're not something that you believe you are so if you're feeling super negative and you're just trying to like affirm that no you're great you're like kind of piling shit on top of shit but you're actually introducing curiosity and possibility as the antidote to negative self-talk which is really different i think that's really different why not hmm you know, it's, it's so much less, it's so much more neutral. And I'll give you, I'll give you a great practical example of the, one of the presentations that you mentioned to the CEO of this huge real estate company in Australia. 
and and I asked him a couple of open questions and listened for about 40 minutes at the start of what was about a two and a half hour long presentation. And one of the questions I asked him was about uh, what did he want to achieve with the with the company? And his big thing was he wanted to take companies from good to great. And, and his goals were quite aggressive for a CEO. And, I, and he had a bunch of metrics that he wanted to achieve and CRM systems and HR processes and all this other bullshit. And I said to him, what about becoming the best real estate company in Australia? And you could see his eyes sort of cock, look up and left and he was thinking about it. And I said, you do realize that in order for that to happen, you need to become the best real estate CEO in Australia. And this is no word of a lie. I had the CEO of a major real estate company stand up from his chair on a Zoom call and yell at the top of his lung, I'm the world's best real estate CEO. And uh, and whether that goes on to happen or not, he's now got a new mm. reframed idea of what is actually possible. And all the stuff he was talking about, all the metrics and the HR and so all that will take care of itself because if he's exemplifying what the world's best real estate CEO does, then by leading by example, everyone, everything else will fall in, fall in behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the why becomes clear, the how becomes easy, as I know you know that that quote. Yes, yes. And, I, I, you know, it's so fun listening to you talk because when I thought of courage and the way that we talk about courage and massive action, it kind of felt, and I don't know if this has been your experience, but to me it had kind of gotten cheapened a little bit in the in the world in the personal development world where it was kind of like chasing an edge just for the sake of chasing a courage edge and it didn't feel super intentional it just kind of felt like what's the biggest scariest boldest thing i can do to try to get the most impressive successful jump i can get you know it felt very like skydiving you know what i mean not not that i mean skydiving is fun but just kind of like adrenaline filled more than intention filled and when I hear you talk about courage, you know, some other words that pop up besides just esteem and respect are integrity, curiosity, belief, and purpose. And if I look at those words as a, uh, let's just, I'm just making up that that's like your formula for courage. All of a sudden it's like, well, that sounds like something that I could really get behind. I have zero formal qualifications. I got the same results in science and economics two years in a row at high school with the same curriculum. I never went to university. I never took a writing course. I've got a, a personal training certification that they emailed me automatically after I did about 13%, <laughs> which I have no interest in doing. And here I am. I got a book coming out that's been endorsed by some of my heroes, some of the greatest literary writers on the planet, sporting heroes. Who the fuck am I? Who, who, how dare I be this person? And, and what it is, is just I've made a commitment to myself. I'm like, you know what? I'm on this planet for, well, I'm planning on being 150 years, right? My GP's got a little permanent note that comes up that says patient's going to live to 150, right? With modern science anything's possible. And I'm going to take this as far as I can, because one thing I've learned on my own podcast is that the people that I'm, that I'm talking to that have achieved these wondrous things, they're just like you and me. They just got the balls, the fucking dino balls to go and do something about it and to take massive, bold and courageous action hmm. and put their balls on the line metaphorically. Right. And, and, and I realized I could add a lot of value to their life as well. And I, so I don't, look at these people and put them on a pedestal in the way that I used to. I, I now look at them in a way that, you know, I can add a lot of value to this, this person's life. And maybe it's that experience of putting yourself in a position where you are talking to these people and realizing that they are just as human as you and I, that really makes it a lot more attainable. Mm. Maybe that's the seat. Maybe that's the secret. I want to go 1900 different places. Um, how dare I? <laughs> no, I love that you said that because that's where so many people are coming from. I need your permission, you being 
some vague external regulatory board or tribe that's likely to behead me if I get it wrong. Like, that's what it feels like. How dare I decide I'm the world's best courage coach? How dare I claim what's mine? How dare I fulfill my purpose? I can feel some truth in that as I speak it. So I want you to like preach on that. Well, I'll give you a great example. I had Jack Canfield, the number one success coach in North America, which basically means the world, right? Yeah. He came on the podcast. The very first question I asked him was this, and I have my darling fiance's permission to share this. I said, Jack, and he's been on Oprah Super Soul Sundays. For people don't know Jack Canford. He wrote Success Principles and co-authored the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series, 600 million books. I said, Jack, my fiance and I have endured at that time 12 consecutive miscarriages. What advice would you give us to help bring this baby into the world? Now, can you imagine being asked that question? I know for a fact that he's never been asked that question before because he told me afterwards. And he, he gave us some wondrous, wonderful uh, examples that we could use. And then the second question I asked him was, Jack, what do you need help with? And he said, you know, Laban, I'm actually really good. I don't have any challenges at the moment. He said, oh, actually, there's one. I've been trying to shift 15 pounds of weight around my waist. And I said, Jack, he said, yeah. I said, today's your lucky day. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, why is that? I said, because what I didn't tell you about my fabulous transformation is I lost 60 pounds of body fat and put on 30 pounds of muscle. And if that's something you'd be interested in learning about, we can talk about it at the end of the show. Mm. And when the podcast section finished, I had the number one success coach in the world asking me for my advice on my diet. And I, when I got off that call, I was like, holy shit, like that was a real pivotal moment in my life. And I was like, wow, I can add a lot of value in people's lives. And I've done a number of other things with other people as well. Mm -hmm. And some that aren't famous, some people that are just random people in the street, you know. But yeah. when you understand the power of your own experience, the power of the shit that you've gone through, the shit that you've eaten, and how that can help other people. You know, Frank Abagnale from Catch Me If You Can, the, the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, taught us a whole semester of school when he was 17. And they asked him years later, like, Frank, like a real guy, how did you do that? And he was like, I just stayed one lesson ahead of the kids. And that's the thing. We, we don't need to have achieved a, a lifetime full of adversity to be able to help other people with our knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, and as I keep going and putting myself out of my comfort zone, then I can then share more knowledge. It's, it's, you don't stop. And I think, you know, motivational speakers or a lot of people in this space cop a bad rap, some des deservedly, because they stop. And they stay stuck in this area rather than continuing to push their limits and, and continuing to grow and learn. And that's what I'm all, I'm all about. The more, I, the more I'm on this planet, the, the, the less I realize I know. Mm -hmm. And I own that and I realize that, but I can share some of the stuff that I, that I do know and, and it's helping people. You know, the more you talk about courage, the less I feel I need to take the action that I want to take in my life. And I think that is, that is magical. It's magic because what I see you doing is you're talking about massive action and from the outside, it really, it, it looks and is massive action in terms of the results that you create. But what I'm getting as you speak is that because of the way that you look at helping people and valuing yourself, and living from purpose and belief and having esteem, the less courage you need to take that action. It's like you've, the way that you look at it is that that massive action, you shrink the jump to like a hop. Is that accurate? Am I understanding that right? That spot on. Why do you think people love hanging around elite athletes and, and I suppose movie stars to some extent that that dynamic has sort of shifted in the last 20 years, but like, Everyone wants to be around the best athletes, Olympic athletes. Why is that? Because they're the fucking best at what they do. Well, what does that represent? It's it's a commitment to action that they've taken and, and they're not afraid to, to step out of their own comfort. You can't become a world champion Olympic sprinter by taking the shortcut. Like it's just, and, and that's what people must understand about this whole process. Whatever it is that you want to 
do with your life, the impact that you want to have. Mine just happens to be courage. Yours could be being a world champion knitter or embroidery, like, or kayaker or author or radio announcer or chef. I don't know. I don't know what, whatever your purpose is. And you can, you can, there's a few ways that you can figure that out. And we can talk about that as well, if you like. Um, that is a, I would really encourage anyone listening to this to take Laban up on that because he's brilliant at it. And, um, why do you think, actually, wait, let me ask this question differently. Once you're comfortable, it's real cozy and easy to stay comfortable. <laughs> So someone who's sitting there comfortable, who's hearing this and it's like reverberating as true and they're still like, oh, but I'm so comfortable or like, oh, like how, what would you say to somebody who really, really genuinely does want to change and is battling with that just complacent comfort? What would you say to them? How's that working out for you? So good, so perfect. I, I don't, I don't care. Like I care about people, but I don't care about people that don't want to mm -hmm. be brave enough to take action. Mm -hmm. And that's why the people that I work with are a, a much smaller number than you might expect, because there's a lot of people in that situation. You've got to reach a point of pain and discomfort where you've got to do something about it. Yeah. And there's no judgment here. It's just like if you continue doing what you're doing, what's your life going to look like in five years? I can tell you what it's going to look like. Yeah. It's going to leave you even more unfulfilled and you've got less time to do it because you're a mortal, finite being. We are infinite souls. You're going to have to come and reincarnate and finish that shit off. So why not get it done now? Sort that intergenerational trauma out now. Yeah. Knock that shit on the head now. Become your own superhero for fear of crowbarring my podcast name in there, you know? Well, That's I'm the whole sorry. point of the name. How's that working out for you? Such a powerful question. You know, I think you hit on something really important where what is your life going to look like in five years? we It's so interesting. We both live completely out of the present moment and act as if we have all the time in the world. And I love that two, those two questions, I think, together are a power combo. How is that working out? And what is your life going to look like in five years? Because it really, really challenges you to look at reality. And, and like you said, not in a judgmental way, but just really look at like, how is that working? Probably not great. Yes, but on it. And like I said, you know, like my life is not without challenges. Like mm. Anna and I have had, you know, the, the, the brutality of that, th you know, 13 miscarriages plus two ectopic pregnancies, and uh, it's something that we're getting to the, the root cause of. And, and we're really amazingly confident that we're going to get a solution, you know. But if the universe doesn't want us to be able to make our own babies, then we'll move on to the next thing, you know. Like, And this is the thing. If you meet Anna and you look at her, you, you would never know that she'd gone through that. And it's because, again, like I said earlier, like you, you look at what's happened to you and you use that as fuel. I'm not a victim. What? We can't really control what happens to us, but we can control how we react to it. And that's the that's the the catalyst here. No more victim mindset. Mm -hmm. And that help that goes out the window when you start s s talking to yourself like someone you really fucking care about. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just honestly like I'm just really listening and I'm like, yep, I oh right, I'm the host of the show. <laughs> What's, it's like what's the work that you do as well, Vanessa, and, and you know the coaching that you do and the impact you have on people's lives. It's just, it's like the the bowling alley, and you get the safety barriers that come up. You know, sometimes they have inflatable ones when they've got the kids, and sometimes we just need a little bit of guidance. Mm. And that that's all I got access to. And I and I was able to ask for help, not not to appear weak, but so that I could remain strong. Yeah. And 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 I kept asking for help until I got it. None of this has been a solo effort. I have called in more favors than you can shake a stick at. <laughs> so now I've got an obligation to pay that shit forward now that I'm in slightly more control than, than what I was, you know? Mm. 
And that's that's the whole point of pinning the book, putting all of my vulnerabilities out there to the world so that I that, that's the final act of ownership, you know. And and I'm I'm gonna ask you to talk about your book in a second because it's so this book gets your heart rate racing. It's like you're mad at it, you're drawn in, you're freaking out. It's like when you watch a movie, you know, a scary movie, and you're like, no, don't go in there. That's how I feel reading your book. <laughs> laughing out loud, triggered as fuck, excited, inspired. It's so, it's everything, every experience you can imagine in a book and written with just this magnificent poetic prose. It's just fantastic. Um, so, all right, I'm going to ask you one final question and uh, we could go on for hours because there's so much wisdom in you. But um, it's your last breath. I'm going to try to throw you a challenging question. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't challenge any of my other guests like this, but I'm going to do it with you. Bring it on. Bring it on. What it's, do you got for me? It's your last breath. You can offer one more thing to the world. Here, let me, this is the part, this is the challenge part. Here, here's the way it's coming up. It's, Either something you've never said before, or a way you've never said it before. What's your final departing wisdom? Am I allowed to ask who is in my presence that can hear this? <laughs> does it? If it feels, does it make a difference? I was just going to admit that I um. I flogged some milk money from my father. <laughs> <laughs> my last breath, my last breath. Do you know what? I wouldn't, I, I'm not so concerned about one final impact on the world because A, I have no fear of death. B, I understand that we are, like I said, infinite spiritual beings that, that are inhabiting the human form. Whether you believe in this stuff or not, right? And I know there'll be a further opportunity to to share more message. All right, let so me maybe maybe I'm my God, and I'm calling this your last line. <laughs> All right, my last breath. I would say something along the lines of "fuck yes." That Fuck is, yes. Yeah, I love that. That's so. Do you know the last word that I wrote down for when I was deconstructing your courage was gratitude. <laughs> yeah, it was like you just like you've got a, a you've got gratitude and humility and joy for life and so it's beautiful thanks thanks Vanessa. if i was to die tomorrow i've lived a life that most people only read about in books and the beauty in all of this is that you dear listener watcher have that within you as well mm. And what is your life going to look like in 12 months if you keep doing what you're doing or in six months? What's stopping you from sharing your message with the world, from writing a book, from creating massive impact, from speaking to the CEOs of the biggest companies on the planet and telling them that you're the world's best courage coach, you know, come for the title. Yeah. Rising tide lifts all boats. Tell those who are listening how they can find you, talk to you, connect with you, and talk about your book. So the book will be released in December of 2021 at the very latest. The audio book has been recorded in Berlin on all the English-speaking uh, Amazon sites, labanditchburn.com is where you can register for all the updates on there and you can access all the social media accounts and the podcast and everything else that you want to know about me. And uh, if you want to know even more than that, you can send me a message. You can ask me anything you want as long as you're happy to hear the answer. <laughs> uh, thanks, Laban. This is awesome. Uh, well, thank you, Vanessa. It's a, it's a huge honour. I, I, the guests that you've had on the podcast to this point uh, some truly humbling individuals and uh, keep doing what you're doing because you are you are creating such wonderful magic. So thank you. Thanks.